Well, friends, today we are wrapping up our series on the LGBTQ movement as we've been looking at what God says about sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, so far in this series, we've seen that God created us male and female as men and women, and he designed sex to be enjoyed when a man and a woman come together in marriage. And while sex is pleasurable and it's necessary for procreation, God also designed gender and sex in a way that reveals the Trinity, how God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and how we are welcomed into the relationships that exist within the very being of God, right? Where that one flesh union of a husband and wife is a picture of the deep relationship that we can have with God through Jesus Christ. And so rather than focusing on our gender to find our identity, we should find our identity, our, our value, and the purpose of our lives in Christ, right? We should look to Jesus for our identity, And the orientation of our lives shouldn't be about sex, but about God as we choose to love him with all that we are because he has loved us so completely even though we don't deserve it, right? We should love God because he first loved us. Now, whether you agree with these conclusions or not, and if you want to have a more detailed explanation of those conclusions, you can go and check out the earlier parts of this series on our website, but whether you agree or not, we can still have these difficult discussions as long as we continue to love and respect each other by following the three truths or important reminders that we've kept forefront throughout this series. Uh, Friends, we need to love and value everyone because everyone is loved and valued by God. God made each and every one of us in his image to be like him and to have a relationship with him. And so he has given us incredible value, which is why we should respect each other, even if we disagree. Now, this respecting of one another shouldn't just apply when we're face to face with other people, although it should definitely apply then, but it should also apply at all times. Even when we might be talking about this topic with those that we know agree with us when we don't think others are around, but they still might overhear what we say, right? And so being loving and respectful is important all the time because we don't want to cause unnecessary offense and possibly hurt someone or break their trust in us or even cause us to lose our relationship with them. And so we need to be careful in what we say as well as in how we say it. However, with that said, although we're supposed to love each other, we need to remember that love is not the same as blind acceptance or agreement with someone's viewpoint, lifestyle, or behavior. Love is gracious, but it also points to the truth because if we ignore the truth, someone could get hurt or we could end up hurting ourselves. And so... We should love Jesus and love others ultimately by pointing them to Jesus who is the truth and who leads us into all truth. And friends, if we keep these reminders in mind, we will do well in our conversations about difficult and controversial subjects. And so with those in mind today, we're going to wrap up this series by taking a big picture look at the LGBTQ movement, which is often called the pride movement and prides itself on loving people and helping people to take pride in themselves no matter their sexual orientation or gender identity. And we're going to take a look at this by asking ourselves and, and looking at whether or not the pride movement is actually about love or about pride, as they call themselves. Now, one of the main tenets of the pride movement is advocating for people to be able to express their sexuality and their sexual orientation, as well as their gender identity or however they want to identify, without any restrictions. Uh, Whether somebody is lesbian, gay, bisexual, wants to have a threesome, participate in orgies, have sex with animals or minors or whatever it may be, 
the LGBTQ movement continues to push for acceptance of these practices at a public societal level. Now, let me be clear, that doesn't mean that everybody in the LGBTQ uh, community agrees with all of those things. There are many who disagree with certain aspects still. still. But it is something, as we've seen in previous weeks, that those are the directions that the LGBTQ movement is moving towards. The same is also true for gender identity, where we're told by pride activists that we have to not only accept, but also refer to people by their chosen genders and pronouns and allow these individuals to live out their gender choices, where men are allowed into women's change rooms and can compete against biological women in sports, where we've seen that there are, have been women who have been impregnated by men who have been allowed into women's prisons, and where children are given puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and gender reassignment surgeries that are not reversible, even though they are often told that they are. Now, this advocacy is done in the name of love, uh, in the name of love and acceptance, where people are told to embrace who they truly are live out whatever sexual desires they have, and be whoever they want to be. In fact, we're also told that we have to accept everyone as they say they are, otherwise we're the ones who are wrong. Or we're the ones who are bad or evil, we're bigots and homophobes, and all of the other uh, names that are thrown at anyone who disagrees with the pride agenda. Again, this name calling doesn't sound very loving, but it is supposedly done in the name of love. Uh, and friends, it, that is how it is often sold in our community. Uh, an example of things being framed in the name of love uh, is seen in our and through our own Ministry of Education here in British Columbia. Uh, according to one of their own documents, uh, it says that SOGI is about stopping bullying and making schools a welcoming place for everyone. It's about accepting everyone for who they are. Now that sounds very loving, doesn't it? That sounds like it's about acceptance. That it's just about, hey, we're, we're not going to promote or push this or teach this. We just want everybody to accept everybody else. But friends, we know that's not the whole story. Right, if you look at what's being taught in our schools, you'll see that these different kinds of sexual orientations and gender identities aren't just being promoted for acceptance. They're actually being pushed to the point of trying to convert people to the pride movement. Uh, schools are currently exposing young children to drag queen story times. This is happening in libraries and in schools across North America. Older children are forced to read LGBTQ books if they want to be competitive in school competitions like Battle of the Books, where the book list includes LGBTQ-themed books. Uh, one of our own sons, when he was in elementary school, came home with some books. He said, hey, I got to read these so that I know them and I'm ready to be quizzed for Battle of the Books. And we took a look at the cover, read the back, and said, sorry, we're not going to let you read these because they're trying to push gender ideologies. Uh, high school students are also being encouraged to support LGBTQ events such as uh, marching in pride parades where they're not only encouraged to do so, they're allowed to. They're, they're allowed to skip class in order to go and march. Whereas other teenagers who choose to march in parades that celebrate and, and advocate for a traditional view of marriage and sex and gender uh, identities are often penalized, getting marked absent, and sometimes even having further action taken against them. Now, I don't know about you, but to me this sounds more like coercion than love. And just to be clear, this isn't something that is just happening uh, from our provincial government. It's also happening at the federal level. Some of you might have heard of Bill C-4 that came into effect back in January of 2022. Bill C-4 bans conversion therapy, which is a term used to refer to the many horrific ways that people used in the past 
to try to convert gay people to being heterosexual, as well as change transgender people's gender identity to match their biological sex. Uh, it included things like brain surgery, surgical or hormonal castration, and aversion therapies like electroshock. Now friends, these are horrible things that most of society accepted, not just the church, although the church in general was complicit as well. But let me be clear, these were wrong. They should not have been done to people. It was wrong to hurt people in this way. It was wrong. It was a sin. It should not have been done. I want to be absolutely clear on those kinds of supposed conversion therapy. But now, in reaction to that, our federal government through Bill C-4 has gone to the other end of the spectrum. They've gone too far the other way, redefining conversion therapy and making any form of what they now deem as conversion therapy illegal. From our government's own Library of Congress website, where there's an overview of Bill C-4, we see that conversion therapy is any practice, treatment, or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, change a person's gender identity to cisgender, which simply means change their gender identity to match their biological sex. Uh, it also includes changing a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth, uh, to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, to repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity, or repress or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. Now there's a lot of big words in there, a lot of legal jargon uh, in our legal code, but there are ver two very important things to notice in this definition of conversion therapy. First, what is prohibited is trying to convert someone to heterosexuality within the realm of sexual orientation and trying to change someone's gender identity and expression to match their biological sex in the realm of gender identity. In other words, trying to convert people to embrace God's design for sex and identity is wrong and illegal, but going the other way, trying to convert people towards homosexuality or other forms of sexual orientation and gender identity outside of God's design uh, is not only seen as good and right, but it's also now the only legal form. Friends, there are no laws or regulations against trying to convert people to homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, and every other sexual orientation and gender identity outside of God's design. This law only covers conversion in one direction, not the other. Now, the second thing to notice is what is now included as conversion therapy, which is any practice any treatment, any service that would do these things. This could include a teenager talking to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, even just a, a counselor uh, because they're confused about how they feel inside as they're going through puberty. But friends, that counselor's hands are tied. If a guy or a girl is having romantic feelings for someone of the same sex, or if they're wrestling with whether they're a boy or a girl because their bodies are going through major changes with hormonal fluctuations as we've all experienced, right? A counselor can encourage them to hang in there and that everything will calm down in a few years. But, but the moment the student says they think they're gay or bisexual or transgender or whatever it is, the counselor is no longer able to push back against that belief. They simply have to affirm those feelings, even if those feelings will eventually pass. And that's why there are many people who are now going through a detransitioning process because when they were going through that tumultuous time of being a teenager and going through puberty, they were told, well, yeah, maybe you are 
a, a boy trapped in a girl's body or a girl trapped in a boy's body. Maybe you should take puberty blockers and hormone therapy and have certain body parts removed or changed or all of those kinds of things. And if they had just held out for a few more years, things would have calmed down. But they've now gone through permanent changes that although they can try to undo some of those things surgically, many of those changes are now permanent and cannot be undone. In fact, this aspect of trying to help and walk alongside of children and youth and other people who are wrestling with some of these things, right? Th this is the same for every profession, whether it's a family doctor, a teacher, a coach, or any trusted adult in a professional role. Friends, even this series of messages could be considered conversion therapy under this law, making this a very dangerous topic to discuss. But friends, we need to talk about it because it is so incredibly important. And so getting back to the, the topic of this message, the LGBTQ movement has framed itself and its advocacy uh, through the lens of love and acceptance. But we need to ask ourselves, is it truly love or is it pride as they call themselves? Right, throughout this series, we've looked a lot at love. Right, Lore, Love has been at the core of what we've talked about. Uh, it's at the center of our three important truths or reminders. Uh, the question, what is love, was one of our discussion questions that we talked about around our tables back in part two. And the love of Jesus for us has been foundational to our understanding of how love is not just a feeling, but a choice. It's a desire for the good of another person, which requires truth and grace telling people how things really are according to God who made everything and knows how things work best, but doing so in a kind and considerate way. And of course, love is sacrificial as shown in Jesus laying down his life for us. So that's love. But what's pride? What is pride? Before we answer that question, I'm going to give you a, a couple minutes to discuss that question with the people sitting around you. Take a few moments, talk about with each other about what pride is, and then we'll come back together and keep going.
All right. Well, hopefully you had some good discussion with one another about what pride is. And, and the reality is in, in our culture and society today, we use that word pride or being proud in all kinds of different ways. Uh, I looked up the word pride in the dictionary and yeah, it, it can be used in all kinds of ways to describe different things. Uh, for example, pride can refer to a group of lions. Although that's not what we're really talking about today, right? Uh, but it can refer to the best within a group, such as a high-achieving student being the pride of their teacher or a stallion being the pride of its herd. It could also be the state or feeling of satisfaction or pleasure, such as being proud of a job well done or being proud to be Canadian on this Canada Day weekend. Uh, our culture has also connected pride with self-respect and self-esteem, such as when someone believes they are due for a raise or a promotion. And I would say that this last point may be beginning to cross that line into where pride would, we would often see as becoming a negative thing where pride is a thinking uh, too highly of oneself, where our egos inflate, our, our heads get a little bit bigger, and we think that we can do whatever we want because life is all about us. And so the question is, well, what kind of pride characterizes the pride movement? Well, while I'm sure many of these might apply where the the pride movement might think of themselves as, you know, the best in our culture and society and um, that they might be proud to be LGBTQ. Uh, at the core of the pride movement is pride, but it's not the good kind of pride. They believe that they are right, that everyone else is wrong, including God when it comes to things like sexual orientation and gender ide identity. And they believe that they should be able to do whatever they want. Now, please hear me. This isn't necessarily true for everyone who supports the LGBTQ movement. Uh, as we've seen in this series, when everything is promoted as an act of love, it's easy to get sucked into believing that it is actually loving. There are many people who uh, identify with or support the LGBTQ movement who believe that what they're doing is actually an act of love. I mean, why shouldn't everyone be able to live out their sexual attractions and desires? Why can't people be homosexual, bisexual, and enjoy sex in different ways? I mean, it sounds loving until we turn to God's word and see that God designed sex a specific way and that when we go outside of his design, it brings pain, uh, devastation, and destruction. And, and just to be clear, that includes things like pornography, like heterosexual sex outside of marriage, divorce, and everything else outside of God's design for marriage and sex. It's a heavy, heavy thing. That's God's design for sex and marriage, though. And, and let's just all be thankful and grateful for God's love and his grace and his forgiveness because I think all of us have fallen short of his perfect design. The same is also true for gender identity, right? It's, it's hard not to think that it's loving to allow people to identify as they want and even physically try to change their bodies so that the outside of their bodies matches the inside of how they feel, especially when transgender teens are five times more likely to commit suicide than the general population. But as we saw a couple of weeks ago, suicide rates increase drastically 10 years after people have gender reaffirming surgeries to roughly 20 times that of the general population. And so gender reassignment surgery might only be pushing back the problem and making things worse. Therefore, the loving thing would be to help people know that they are loved and accepted in the body that God gave them and to help them learn to feel comfortable with how God made them and in who God made them to be. 
But friends, you won't hear those talking points from the pride movement. Right? They'll just keep pushing their doctrines and beliefs on anyone and everyone. Uh, they'll keep pushing the boundaries of our society, flaunting it as they do so, flaunting it as they do so, like these men who marched in the pride parade in Toronto, fully naked with families and children watching. And if you've ever tried to have a discussion with somebody who is all out in the pride uh, movement, uh, you'll know that when you disagree with them, they'll treat you like an enemy. They won't engage in healthy discussions and discourse. Instead, they often re resort to verbal abuse and sometimes even violence. And this is all because they believe that they have the right to define sex and gender and force what they want on society. They don't want to submit to God, to his will and his way. They want to be God of their own lives and live their own way, which is the ultimate form of pride. All right? It's all about themselves. And friends, pride is not something that God uh, loves or affirms. Uh, listen to how the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, described the fall of the king of Babylon and the spiritual power be behind this king, namely Satan. In Isaiah 14, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I notice how it's all about I. I will ascend. I will raise my throne. I will sit enthroned. I will make myself like God. Friends, it was absolute pride when Satan believed that he was greater than God. But that's what we all do when we choose to live our lives our own way and for ourselves instead of for the one who made us, who loves us, and who died for us. But friends, that's what the pride movement is doing when they try to redefine sex and gender. It's open rebellion towards God out of, belief, out of the belief that we are the gods of our own lives as they fight for their rights, their privileges, their desires, and what they believe they deserve. And so no, it's not actually love that drives the LGBTQ movement, it's pride. Because if it was love, it would look like Jesus and his followers who didn't demand their rights, but who willingly endured suffering, who went through all kinds of persecution, and who even laid down their lives and were put to death so that we could be saved and so that we could have the good news of Jesus shared with us. I mean, just look at the example of the love of Jesus when Jesus was getting arrested and his followers saw what was about to happen, they said to him, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. I mean, that's pretty radical. Right here, his followers are like, Jesus, do you want us to defend you? And Peter goes and cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest who was part of the crowd coming to arrest Jesus. And Jesus goes, no, stop it. And he even heals one of his enemies. Then when false charges were brought against Jesus while he was being tried before the high priest, Jesus simply stayed silent rather than demand his rights or demand justice. In Mark 14, we're told, the, that the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. In fact, even when he was brought before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor at that time, who had the power to put Jesus to death, Jesus didn't try to argue his case. In Matthew 27, we see that when he, Jesus, was accused 
by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Pilate would have put many criminals, many people to death. Jesus was the first one to never argue, to never fight back, to willingly lay down his life. And that got Pilate's attention. Friends, all of this was to fulfill the prophecy made by the prophet Isaiah who wrote that he, Jesus, was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus willingly laid down his life for us. He didn't fight it or resist. He didn't demand his rights or the privileges that we think we all deserve. He didn't demand justice. He willingly laid down his life. Now, I know you're probably thinking like I am. Well, that's Jesus I mean, he came into this world to die for us. And that would make sense, except for the fact that then Scripture goes on to tell us in the New Testament that his followers did the same thing. Uh, As an example, we know from Scripture that the Apostle Paul had been arrested and beaten time and time again. And yet his adversaries were blown away by the fact that he didn't try to fight back or resist them. I mean, if Paul knew that there was a conspiracy out there to murder him, he tried to avoid it, but he never shied away from sharing the good news of Jesus, even if that meant his arrest, his mistreatment, and even his death. Paul wrote about his own experiences in 2 Corinthians 11, where he wrote that he had been in prison frequently, been flogged severely, and been exposed to death again and again. In fact, one time when Paul and his companion Silas were imprisoned, they sang songs of worship and praise while in prison. In Acts 16, it says that the magistrates ordered them, ordered Paul and Silas, to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And so, yes, they didn't maybe always stay silent, but they didn't complain or demand their rights. Instead, they used the opportunity to share Jesus with others. And as they did so, they didn't care about the consequences of speaking about Jesus because they loved Jesus so much. They didn't care that they were being falsely accused, mistreated, beaten, and continuously faced death threats. They loved Jesus so much, not only did they trust him with their lives, But they wanted other people to know the one that they loved so much, even if it required their death. Friends, love doesn't demand our rights. It doesn't demand what we desire. It doesn't demand our privileges. That is pride. And pride is something that we all wrestle with in our lives. C.S. Lewis, the great theologian and author of many books, including the well-known Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, that the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all of that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. Did he catch that? Pride is the chief cause of all misery. And so friends, we are called to fight against pride pride 
not just the pride movement and their efforts to redefine what God has made clear about sex and gender, but also the pride that underscores every sin in our lives. And remember, we don't fight these battles in the same way that the world fights their battles, right? We fight God's way. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Now, friends, we could spend an entire message just on this one passage here. Uh, but let me highlight four ways that you can fight God's way and not the way that the world fights. First, demolish strongholds of evil, not people. Right? Again, we're not in this battle against people. We're against strongholds of evil, right? Demonic strongholds. Strongholds of evil are where Satan has gained ground and is firmly established in the lives of people, in the organizations of our society, and at the heart of our culture. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have the power to demolish those strongholds. Actually, I do know about you. You don't either. But we know the one who does. We know the one who has the power to defeat Satan. And so, friends, we need to ask Jesus to destroy those strongholds. We need to pray. We need to ask Jesus to destroy the strongholds of the evil one in our culture, in the lives of the people that we know, and in our own lives as well. Next, attack arguments and pretensions or, or claims with the knowledge of God. Right, we don't just attack the arguments against the knowledge of God, but we actually use the knowledge of God to attack those arguments that are set up against God. But in order to do that, this requires you to know God so well through prayer and through reading your Bible that you're able to make convincing arguments that refute the arguments that are set up against God. That's scary. That's challenging. But we're called to know God so well that we are always ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Third, make every thought obedient to Jesus. You do this by taking every thought captive, comparing it to the life and the teachings of Jesus, and then siding with whatever Jesus said and did, replacing your thoughts with his thoughts. This means that you'll be refining your own thinking and constantly challenging yourself with Scripture. And finally, friends, discipline yourself and get help, get the help of others to help you do that. Right? Set up accountability where you punish yourself or ask someone else to hold you accountable, giving them permission to push you towards obedience to Christ. Friends, that's how we fight the pride movement and amazingly, that's also how we fight pride in our own lives because these practices will keep us humble and they will keep us dependent on Jesus. And so in closing, friends, instead of being full of pride, fill yourself with love. Choose love. Love longs to please Jesus and it strives for the good of others. Love longs for people to know the truth which is good for them and we know that Jesus is the source of all truth. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And friends, love longs for people to see the example and the love of Jesus through you. Through your life. Even if that means hardship for you, a, a laying down of what most people would say are your rights or your privileges or, or what you deserve so that others can see and hear of Jesus through your life, your suffering, even your death. That is love. 
And so, friends, let's not give in to the easy love of the LGBTQ movement, which is actually pride. Let's stand for truth and love where Jesus is the truth and God is love. Let's speak the truth in love, pointing people to Jesus and his instructions for life in an appealing and convincing way. And let's live out truth and love, leading people to Jesus through the example of our own conduct. The way that we live our lives, our own marriages and relationships, treating all people with value and dignity, even if they treat us like garbage, but never compromising on the good news of Jesus that in the area of sexual orientation and gender identity reveals that we can have an incredibly close relationship with Jesus, so much so that we are not only welcomed into the presence of God, but we are welcomed into the very relationships that exist within the Trinity. Friends, that's only possible if we choose love, if we choose Jesus. So let's choose him. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, as we wrap up this series on this challenging and and difficult subject and topic, uh, God, we ask that you would just continue to correct our thinking. Lord, anytime our thoughts are not your thoughts or our ways are not your ways, Lord, would you confront us with Scripture? Would you help us to put to death the pride in our lives and be willing to submit to your leadership, to your leading in our lives? And God, as we follow you more and more, we ask that you would fill us with a boldness. Not to create fights or or problems in our culture and society, but simply to stand for the truth and to stand for love. That the truth of your word might be proclaimed uh, through our mouths, through our lives and our examples. That when people look at us, when they see that we don't demand our rights or our, our freedoms, that they would sit up and take notice that like Pilate, they might be astonished or like the other prisoners uh, with Paul and Silas, they might sit and listen and be open to the good news of Jesus. Lord, lead us and guide us. Help us to be a people of love and not of pride and help us to follow your example in our lives. In your name we pray, amen.